Wayne has uh, recently joined um, our Rochester chapter council uh, as a, uh, a new member and uh, Wayne had volunteered to give this one. And so we're really thankful that, for that. Wayne, go for it. Thanks, Dave. I'm, I'm an independent consultant and uh, I, uh, I work with a company locally named D3 and D3 has their customers. And uh, uh, many of those customers have names you would recognize, but I, I don't think I can say them. They, they often come to us and say things like, I have a camera system, uh, um, it's HDR. I want you to tune it and make it produce image data exactly like my existing system, which is a, uh, a computer vision system. And, uh, and you know, maintain all, all the data from it. And, and of course, they even, some have even said, and this is true, uh, one, one person said to me, and I wanna have, um, color fidelity better than one delta E throughout the entire tone scale. I said, you know, that's impossible. And she said, oh, I know it's possible. I don't know how, but I've seen it done. Um, so so with, with customers like these, and most of the applications are in uh, the area of um, uh, uh, autonomous driving vehicles, um, that, that type of thing, uh, give, given, given that requirement, of give me give me an image from an HDR sensor that's never overexposed or underexposed, maintains all the data using the camera that I already have and using the existing uh, hardware. Um, you know, solve my problem. And of course, that's that's a, that's a very hard problem. And uh, this is the result of spending many many months on this problem. Uh, I have a solution, I believe, um, which will deliver on on their request. It may not be in the exact form factors I just described it. But uh, let me tell you what I did and how I figured it out. And um, uh, I hope you'll find something interesting along the way. I'm gonna start out with some, some background stuff. Um, I know not everybody is a, a camera sensor person. And uh, so I'm gonna do a little, little, little background stuff and build on that. And in the end, we'll, we'll talk about how to make this thing work in a machine vision ecosystem. So, so back and way up here, um, here's a generic uh, CMOS sensor picture. Um, so uh, an HDR sensor, of course, is a sensor which, which can acquire, um, you know, 20 stops, 24 stops of dynamic range. So uh, a million to one or four million to one kind of range, um, which is much higher than, than current sensors. So I, I was going to go through first on, on how, does it, how does it acquire that data. Um, Generic, generic CMOS sensor here on the screen. But really, everyone can, can see the screen, right? I hope. I can see the screen, but I only see your title slide at the moment. I second. <clears throat> you only see the title slide? Correct. That is, oh, 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 wait a second. All right, so here's a generic CMOS sensor. Um, of course, the pixel arranged in a grid. Um, there are rows which are read out uh, um, for for each, each row in the image, and uh, when an, row is read out, each, each pixel uh, signal is amplified, um, it, uh, it's converted to a digital signal. There's some on-sensor processing, which I'll talk about in a minute, that goes to an ISP, which is called an image signal processor, which, which applies all the algorithms necessary to convert a raw CMOS image to a uh, full color uh, sRGB image. Um, and by the way, we're not a huge group today, and I see everyone is on mute, which is great. Um, should you have a question or something as we go along, please feel free to unmute and, and ask. Uh, um, I think we can move along nicely and there'd be nothing worse than having me go on for some period of time. And if only I had included one little bit, it would make a lot more sense to you. Um, so please feel free to, to ask questions as we go along. All right, Wayne, I'm gonna ask the first stupid question. Ready? Sure. What is the acronym CDS? Oh, uh, correlated double sampling. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, so let's let's look at a, um, uh, by the way, this organization here, we have, okay, so we have this structure here, we have a pixel, we have, a, we have column infrastructure, we have sensor infrastructure. Um, I, I've, I've reorganized that for size. Here's our pixel infrastructure, our column infrastructure, and our, our imager infrastructure, okay? So it's basically the same picture. Uh, just reorganized because I want to spend a little more time in the, in the per pixel part. So the way a standard dynamic range sensor works is that the incoming light um, arrives a, at a photodiode. That photodiode converts photons to electrons. At the end of exposure, those electrons are shifted onto a capacitor uh, having a certain conversion gain, which converts the electrons to a voltage. 
and you can change that conversion rate based upon the size of the capacitor. That signal is amplified to match the input dynamic range of a uh, analog to digital converter. And then on the sensor, there's some processing which, which occurs on modern sensors. And typically that processing is um, each of these uh, uh, amplifiers can have some variations. And so you end up with uh, a fixed pattern of columns showing up. Um, it can be that the, uh, uh, the dark level is a function about where you are in the sensor. Um, there, there's a number of variations across the sensor. Oftentimes these things are calibrated such that uh, all the work is done on the sensor itself. And so what gets sent to uh, later processing has that taken care of. And it can also include uh, uh, defect correction and things like that. So that's the on-sensor processing. And the ISP, as I, uh, I think I said before, it's the piece of hardware that does all the algorithms which convert a uh, uh, CFA to a 8-bit uh, color image. So if we look at the dynamic range of a standard definition range, a dynamic range image, it's really defined by the size of this electron well. Uh, the Canon EOS 5D Mark IV is a uh, high-end Canon DSLR. It holds 68,000 electrons, uh, has 2.1 noise electrons. So the dynamic range here is a 2.1 to 68,000, which comes out to be 15 stops. Um, if we look at a more humble camera, uh, here's a, an old cell phone. Um, it has about uh, 4,500 pixels, read noise 1.8. It has a dynamic range of about 11 stops. Uh, GoPro, uh, very very similar to the, uh, to the Samsung. And uh, this must be a crappy consumer camera because it doesn't have much dynamic range. If we look at how the SNR works on this, notice the SNR increases um, with the uh, with the signal, um, which is to be expected, uh, and it's the ratio of the number of photoelectrons to the read noise uh, uh, and uh, total noise. So there, there is your there is your basic uh, SDR sensor. Hi, Wayne. I have a question. Uh, two questions, in fact. So first one is, uh, I see that you have converted this full well capacity to stops. How to do that? And uh, like, how, how have you done that? And second, uh, I have a question regarding the conversion gain in the pixel that you have shown here. So uh, this is one topic that I find very difficult to understand how this conversion gain is calculated. Like I understand there is low conversion gain, high conversion gain, but how is it done in the actual pixel? That is a little bit uh, confusing for me. I don't understand that. Okay. Um, to answer the second question, um, I, I I don't have a picture uh, handy of the of the details of the uh, of the um, inside of a pixel. Um, like I said, it's it's a, it's basically functions as a capacitor, and you can have different capacitors capacitors at different sizes. And um, the, the idea is, is to convert the photoelectrons to a convenient number of, uh, of volts. Um, and I, I don't, I guess, I'm probably not answering your question well. Um, is the question, how are the electrons shifted from the photodiode to the capacitor? Oh, uh, what is done basically uh, in the conversion gain? Like, you know, how conversion gain, uh, like the same pixel, uh, you have this LCG and HCG, same uh, set of transistors, change this, uh, uh, the number of electrons that is available during one exposure cycle to, uh, like, you know, for a low conversion gain or a high conversion gain. I, I don't understand that. So, so yeah, you, you can have different size. In fact, we're going to talk about that in just a second. But you can have more than one a capacitor with a switch, a transistor switch, to say, uh, I want to use something that has a, a large capacitance or a small capacitance. If you have a smaller capacitance, the advantage is a given number of electrons gives you more, more voltage, right? Uh, the downside is um, it limits your dynamic range uh, because you can't shift as many, uh, it won't hold as many electrons. You need a higher voltage to push all those electrons on the capacitor. Um, so there, there, there's a trade-off for the size and typically, the, the, the capacitance is used to match the, um, the number of uh, photoelectrons to a convenient voltage uh, that will be amplified for the uh, 
in an on digital converter. Um, did I sort of answer your question? I understood that. So in that case, it means that uh, like in a pixel, you have both a bigger uh, capacitance and a small capacitance for an LCG, LCG. And depending upon the situation, like you know, depending upon which conversion gain is required, you basically read out either from the like collect the charge from either the bigger capacitance or the smaller capacitance. Am I correct? Yes. Yes. Thanks a lot. Um, could you repeat your first question? I'm sorry. The, the, yeah, the first question is uh, uh, how to convert uh, this full well capacity that you have uh, shown here, uh, like in the second uh, column, to dynamic range in stops. How have you done that? Oh, I'm sorry. That's uh, that's a log two. A log okay. base two. Okay, fine, fine. Sorry, I, I'm. I, yeah, I, yeah, that's you know, fine. That was a great question. Thank you for asking that. I. I, I'm, a, I'm a camera guy, so I think I think in terms of stops, the rest of the world thinks in terms of dB. And um, yeah, so that is another uh, question. That I, I don't know whether you have included it later. <laughs> that is another question that I have. How uh, this full well capacity? How you think that in dB? Yeah. So I, I'm, uh, uh, so stops of dB is um, uh, multiplied by three, right? So that would be uh, forty-five dB. Well, wow, thanks a lot. Uh, did that, any other questions? No, thanks a lot. Like, oh, you're welcome. Now it is a question. Yeah. yeah, no, that was that was a great question. Sorry, there, there's this is exactly the kind of questions I wanted. Where where I'm, I've, I've left out something that is obvious to me because I do this every day, and uh, not everyone else does and speaks the same language. So that was a that was a great question. Um, so how do we do HDR? HDR is done two major ways. If you look at the uh, uh, intellectual property, there's there's lots and lots of patents in this space and lots and lots of variations and flavors. But basically the ones that I've dealt with fall into two categories. Um, one is where you use two exposure times. You, uh, you expose the pixel um, and then uh, you convert that to a, uh, uh, convert that to a voltage uh, to a signal and then you expose again very briefly and get a, a shorter a shorter interval and then you um, repeat that process so for every every pixel you get you get two two outputs um, one with a long exposure one with a shorter exposure a second method is um, something called split pixels and uh, there's a picture down here in the lower right and uh, so here's here's your main pixel and then there's a subpixel associated with it. So actually, each one of these little corner ones has a, a, a belongs to one of these neighborhood pixels. Um, and so that that basically has a, a lower quantum efficiency, right? It, it's going less photons will land on this one compared to that one. Therefore, it'll be less sensitive to light. Being less sensitive to light, um, uh, it can be used to uh, record uh, highlight information where this one here may have saturated. So, so those are the two method, basic methods. Um, one, one point to make here is we're extending the dynamic range, but in both methods, we extend the dynamic range not by making uh, um, an SDR type pixel more sensitive. We're doing it by making an SDR like pixel less sensitive. So in other words, we're extending the highlight side of dynamic range. We're not extending the shadow or the, uh, the sensitive side of dynamic range. So here's here's a, an HDR pixel structure. Notice this is a per subpixel. And, and, and to the to the question just a moment ago, uh, we have a fo photodiode, and we know they come in two sizes, big and small. Um, if we take the big photodiode, we would take those electro those uh, photoelectrons. Um, we would put them onto a, um, a large. Let's see, L and H. What do I mean for L and H? High and low, okay, high conversion gain. Um, you put on a low conversion gain, which would be a larger capacitor, it would give a certain voltage and it would be read out. And then the uh, the smaller pixel or uh, the shorter exposure, um, that would go on a, a higher conversion gain capacitor, uh, amplified and sent out. So now we have two 12-bit signals, um, which are, are being processed 
and combined on our on sensor processor. Remember before this guy had no no combining because it had just a single sensor. Um, this guy has to uh, do this HDR merge process. Well, now we have data which is 20 bits deep. And if you want to have a sensor which you can read out very quickly, reading out 20 bits per pixel uh, can really slow things down. So they use a, a transfer curve, uh, piecewise linear curve, uh, to compress this 20-bit data down to 12-bit data. So we had this lookup table, um, kind of a logarithmic-like shape. Uh, that goes to the ISP, which, of course, then has to do an inverse PWL and then do the normal processing. And the output of all these ISPs, despite having this 20-bit dynamic range data, remains uh, on many of them at, uh, at 8 bits per, per pixel. If we look at how these uh, pixel datas are combined, um, I don't want to go through all the math here, but basically, um, maybe the easiest way to describe it here. It, clearly, you've got, you've got two images, um, one, one with uh, more photoelectrons than the other, one more sensitive than the other. So you take the least sensitive one, you multiply that signal up after accounting for the dark level. Um, and then this right here, you, you uh, subtract out the dark level, uh, you multiply it up by this DRE, which is by how much you're extending the dynamic range um, to create uh, a new image. Um, the result of that is, uh, if we look at this line right here, if you had an imager, say that had a um, 20 stop dynamic range natively, like it, like in the SDR pad. It would have an SDR profile like this. When you do this method described here, um, we end up with this dip. Um, so this would be where the, the um, long exposure saturates and then the shorter exposure takes over. And we'll talk about that dip in just a moment. But notice that the, uh, the SNR profile um, takes, takes a, a dip where you transfer from one to the other. And the dip size is equal to this DRE number which is equal to the sensitivity ratio of, of the two. For example, um, these two exposures, um, whatever the ratio of those two exposures are, or in this case would be the ratio of the uh, quantum efficiency. So um, Wayne, that's, that's just a gain term then effectively to, to uh, sort of- Is that the extension? Yeah. It, 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 it's used to derive a gain term. Um, okay. Um, so let's let's go look at the. So here's our SNR. Let's let's go look at how. I have a question. Uh, sorry, oh, sure. Uh, wait. Uh, can you go to the previous slide? Sure. Uh, in this, uh, the output of the PWL it is 12 bits. So why 12 bits is selected? It, like why not 14 bits? Why not 10 bits? Or oh. is it? Yeah. So uh, um, this is probably a better hardware question than an image science question. But, but I'll give you my best guess um, because uh, a lot of these uh, sensors are over a, a serial type bus and um, uh, you can fit conveniently uh, 12 in, 12 bits per pixel fits nicely into, um, you know, three eight bit words. Uh, uh, you could use 16 bits, but that takes, you know, two, two, two words, uh, um, uh, two, two eight bit values per pixel. Uh, 12 is, uh, what, two and a half, I'm oh, sorry, one and a half, uh, one and a half per pixel. Um, it's a trade-off, I think, between maintaining the, uh, the integrity of the data and, uh, and bandwidth, uh, over the transfer to the ISP. In fact, okay. I think a lot of the sensors are configurable and you can decide different, uh, 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 different bit depths. Okay. So this is Bruce. Does this have also have anything to do with the fact that before getting into HDR stuff, it was pretty common for um, ADCs to have 12-bit outputs? Uh, yes. Yes, that could be related to that too as well. Um, if we look back in this chart, we see some of them um, uh, in the higher range anyway are, are 14. There's 14 and 10, and 12 is not represented, which surprised me because I thought, like just like you said, that 12 was pretty common. Mm -hmm. Although it used to be pretty common. It, I mean, these days I've seen more 14-bit A to Ds. And on the other hand, if if you if two bits counts for more, well, yeah, if, if the, the cost, yeah. It, if, if you want to build a cheap camera, you still aren't going to use as many bits. Yep. 
Um, th thank, thank you, Peter, for the suggestion of using uh, this type of graphic. And I, I, uh, I lifted it uh, in concept uh, and, and built on it. So thank you for that. Uh, so so here's, here's a, a, what I want to do in this slide is show an important point. And the point being, um, we have a lot of noise sources. Uh, um, and and, and that's, that's to be expected. But the real question is, out of all the noise sources, is, is there one that that's, um, uh, really stands out uh, compared to the others that, that really should get, get our attention? Uh, um, and, and the answer is yes. And that answer is photon shot noise. Um, so when photons arrive, it's a Poisson process. It's a random process. Uh, photons don't arrive like a machine gun, that, 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 that. Photons arrive more like popcorn popping, right? So at any fixed interval, um, the number of uh, photons that arrive is, is, has a, is, uh, is a random number. And that random number has the statistics here of um, a mean of the number of photons and a standard deviation where the standard deviation equals the mean. It's a Poisson process. Um, th these statistics get multiplied by a quantum efficiency. And then this is the convenient space where we normally account for noise and electrons. Um, added to the photon shot noise, there's a dark current shot noise, and that occurs the same type of Poisson random process where electrons percolate out of the substrate into the electron well, and um, their arrival rate, again, is Poisson. It's, uh, so it has the same kind of statistics as, as the photon shot noise. And then also on top of that is read noise, which is the electronics noise um, in the system. This whole ensemble of some signals gets uh, multiplied by some system gain. Uh, uh, this quantum efficient number is typically is, is obviously uh, a number less between zero and one. Uh, this system gain tends to be a, a number um, which is generally, uh, 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 oh, it's greater than one, but it's it's going to be, um, you know, for very low ISOs, you know, one, two-ish depending upon the limitations of the sensor and the higher for higher ISOs. Added to all that is the quantization noise just comes from the fact of converting it from a continuous signal to a discrete signal. Uh, so that gives us an output of some, uh, uh, some image noise described by a, a mean and a standard deviation. Um, and I'm just gonna black box this whole ISP to say, the overall effect of this is to add some gain from white balance, from uh, uh, color correction. And, uh, and then some additional quantization noise as we uh, apply a nonlinear quantization. Um, here's a, a relative size of noises, the dark current noise on the type of sensors that we deal with. Uh, generally, they're not really super hot. The pixels are fairly small. Um, it tends to be on less than one electron. Uh, read noise tends to be on the order of one to three electrons. Quantization noise on the order of less than half an electron. But the photon shot noise, that can range anywhere on a, out of uh, uh, a 12-bit system uh, up to uh, 64, which would be the square root of 4095. Um, so, so the dominating one here, and the point I want to make is, is uh, the, the dominant noise source are, is photon shot noise. And that comes in here. It doesn't come in. It, it's one thing that drives me a little nuts, and, and I'm sorry to share this with you, because uh, it's, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't be better concerned with what drives me nuts. Um, is when I hear people saying, oh, look at all the sensor noise in that picture. Well, mm. of course, it's not sensor noise. It's, it's photon shot noise, right? The, the sensor had very little to do with uh, adding noise to that picture. Um, and of course, the relationship with this square root and noise dominating is this curve here, which shows that noise increases as you uh, as the signal increases, okay? So, so th this is going to be the basis of much of the analysis we just done from here on out. Um, just to put a bow on it, um, I took a picture in my own basement of my very own color checker using a Nikon D7500. I did it in raw. I took the green channel. I measured the mean and standard deviation of all these patches and the dark bubble. Um, and if I were to plot just the photon shot noise versus all the noise sources, and the photon shot noise is the square root of the patch mean, uh, the all noise is the literal standard deviation of each one of these patches. Um, you can see that indeed that the photon shot noise is slightly less than at the very tail end because it's a small number, but it's almost identical to the, uh, in other words, this curve is dominated by photon shot noise. 
um, let's do a little, a little mental experiment. What if I were to take a picture of this at a lux of 280, um, crank up the light source to a lux of 2800, so it's 10 times more, but decrease the integration time by a factor of 10, right? So, so basically, um, it's a different light level, but I've compensated light level exposure. And obviously, the SNR is exactly the same on, uh, I'm sorry, the noise is the same on both of these. Well, of course they are, because um, in the end, uh, if, you, uh, if you multiply the light level by 10, reduce the integration time by a 10, we've collected the exact same number of photons. Since the noise depends on the number of photons, um, the noise curves are the same. Now, if I take this exact same plot here, and I'm going to plot it as S and R, uh, and so this plot right here is this plot right here of S and R. Now, what, what if instead of having two, uh, uh, two scenes with different light levels, it's one scene, and uh, uh, um, so now I have uh, two Macbeth color checkers, one illuminated in part of the scene at 280, another part of the scene at 2800. Um, and, and I were to create one image out of it, I would, and, and then map it onto the same tone scale, right? So what I'm saying is I'm going to take uh, this, um, uh, the 2800, which has a, a, a very bright signal, and I'm going to multiply it up. So basically, it, it matches the same uh, the patch stats uh, uh, line up, okay? And that's, I'm saying that wrong. What I'm trying to say is um, in an HDR image, we take the, uh, the short integration time and we multiply it up to attach the end of this. And this is where we get our bump. So remember the bump from, uh, oops, back here, the dip size. The dip size comes from the fact that we've got this uh, short integration time. We have a brighter part of the image, short integration time. We scale that up to line up with our, our long integration time and we get an SNR curve like this. And so in this case, for example, the, uh, the pixel would saturate and it would take over and use this, this, this um, short integration time to uh, extend the dynamic range. So, so I'm just trying to illustrate why, why the bump. The bump is because it's exactly this same curve right here, um, shifted up. Now, now this is an SNR, right? So um, I'm saying when I multiply, when I take this curve, I can just shift it right on the mean axis, not on the SNR axis, because remember we're multiplying both the signal and the noise by the gain. And since we're multiplying the numerator and the denominator by the same value, um, it doesn't change the signal to noise. That makes sense. Uh, I, I couldn't get what this genix reflector is. Sorry. Um, let me let me let me try that again. Uh, this this twenty hundred lux image. Uh, okay, does it make sense to go from this curve to this curve? It's the same curve. Uh, admittedly, it's an S and R instead of a noise. Yeah. So uh, I'm dividing by the signal, dividing the signal into the noise. Um, it is it is a log, um, a log axis, not this dimension, but this dimension is log. Um, and what I'm saying is, in an HDR capture, uh, uh, in this kind of capture, we we have a, a long integration time and a short integration time. Yeah. Um, in order to make this HDR image, we take the um, the sh the the short integration time. We have to multiply it up. Uh, so we can, uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm trying to extend the tone scale, like extend the, uh, the, the sensitivity of the sensor. Yeah, yeah. And when I do that, um, we end up with an SNR curve like this. So basically it's the same curve uh, in orange here, but we've, we've multiplied it up uh, um, on this axis, right? We, we multiply it by uh, 10, in fact. Um, so but I'm saying the that, the, that doesn't change the SNR because the yeah. signal we're multiplying has the noise already in it. And so um, if, you, if you take the, uh, the, the uh, SNR and, and multiply, uh, I'm sorry, if you have a signal and multiply it by a value, you multiply both the signal and the noise so it doesn't change the SNR. Yeah, fine. I'm sorry that was so confused and I probably should have practiced how to say that better, but... Uh, I, ho I hope you're still with me. And, and the whole point of this slide here was really just to say, 
Um, it's all about photon shot noise. It, and, and if you take the same exposure and compensate it for it with a, a, a the noise isn't dependent upon the light level. The noise is dependent on the number of photons you collect. That's the point of this chart. And then this chart says, and then when you take the uh, take this curve and multiply it up to extend the dynamic range, uh, um, that explains the day, is, is the whole point of this slide. So that was what I was trying to show. Um, here's a slide which, which talks about, well, you talked about, I talked about two methods of uh, extending dynamic range. What are the pros and cons? And, and I found it humorous because uh, I have a graphic here from on semi. On semi makes this thing called a super whatever. And if you notice, um, uh, uh, multiple exposures is great at everything but one thing, but uh, the Sony solution is um, I'm bad at most everything. Um, and here's the image from Sony, which shows quite clearly that there's something really terrible about the uh, multiple exposure one. So here's, here's the analysis. When you use the multiple exposure one, can you see this tearing in the image, uh, this color shift? Um, because you're exposing the image at different points in time, you're going to get uh, a different record. And uh, as a result, you can end up with these color artifacts uh, when the images are, 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 are stitched together. Um, and on the other side, uh, see all these, these not so goods? Um, See these little pixels right here? These little pixels in the middle uh, can suffer from something called red diffusion. Um, red wavelengths, when they uh, hit the uh, silicon, penetrate deeper into the silicon and can migrate into adjacent pixels. Um, and there's a distance at which they migrate. Um, and because these pixels are so small and so close to the surrounding ones, there's more color mixing, which makes these little pixels actually have a different spectral response than the bigger pixels. And that causes uh, color issues. Um, the fact that uh, um, uh, the bump here, um, typically when they do uh, these different pixels, they only have two different size pixels. That causes a bigger bump. Imagine though, if we had, um, uh, instead of two exposures, if we had 10 exposures, we could constantly keep on this part of the curve, the highest SNR. Um, when you have just two pixels, you're left with a big bump instead of a bunch of little bumps. Um, so that's why they say that uh, uh, it's not so good at noise. Uh, low light, because you're sacrificing some pixel area, they claim it's not a good at low light. Um, so there, there are pros and cons of the different methods. Uh, I've worked with uh, uh, both, both sensor types, and um, I, will, I will reserve judgment. <laughs> Let's just Wayne, say somebody might be trying to uh, come into the meeting. Oh, oh thank you. No, thank you. I, I, I should be paying attention to that list. It's hard to do both. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Um, okay. So in, in short, uh, the, uh, um, the multiple, the um, multiple integration times can give you uh, temporal artifacts and the, uh, the split pixels can give you the compromise of having uh, little pixels next to big pixels. Um, and this idea of the super pixel is uh, uh, they, they've found some way of uh, intermixing the short and long exposures in a way which apparently uh, reduces that. Okay, so let's, let's, um, let's change gears here a little bit. And say so. So we have HDR. We have this HDR sensor. Why? Why do we need it? Do we need it because um, in nature there's a huge range of reflectance, or is it because in nature there's a huge range of uh, scene luminance? And the answer is, the um, the difference in reflectance is fairly small compared to the range of luminance. Uh, here's a Macbeth color checker. Um, the dark patch is 3.1 reflectance. The the bright patch is 90% reflectance. Um, if we take the ratio of those two, that's about 30, uh, um, 30 in stops is about five stops. Um, so we have five stops at the dynamic range. And I contend that if you ever had a shirt that was this white, or better yet, pants that are that white, or better still shoes that are that white, um, uh, nice Lambertian white shoes, how long do you have to wear them before they're no longer 90% reflectors? And, and the same thing with uh, uh, the dark ones, right? If you have a... Uh, uh, a pair of black pants, right? Right. How, how long do those pants stay black? Um, things in nature tend to migrate towards gray. 
and uh, um, things get dirty, things uh, uh, fade. Uh, what I'm saying is in, in, in nature, generally speaking, you will have things which are not this bright and things that are not this dark. Um, and this is only five stops at dynamic range. So my claim is that in nature, spectral, ref uh, spectral reflectance is not the reason for HDR. The reason we need HDR is because of the distribution of scene lighting. I mean, in this scene here, we've got some dark shadows here. We've got direct sunlight here. This is an HDR scene, but it's not HDR because the objects in the scene have a huge dynamic range. It's entirely because the lighting is uh, very uneven throughout the scene. Um, to give you an idea, um, imagine a car going through a tunnel. Um, EV, by the way, is a log base to measure of scene luminance. And uh, uh, bright sun, sand, snow is a, about as bright a condition you can get that has an EV of 16. These are log two numbers. Um, and uh, uh, vehicle and traffic and night vehicle and traffic is EV5. So that, that's 11, 11 stops difference. And this kind of describes the uh, situation where you've got a, a long dark tunnel um, ending up on a beach, um, which is about as a, a larger range as you can get. So th there's 11 stops plus our, uh, plus our five stops here gives us uh, conveniently 11 and five, 16. There are 16 stops at dynamic range. Um, so so that's, how, that's how much is uh, uh, in a scene, how much can a camera capture? Well, um, a typical scene is 10 to 12 stops. And of course, it doesn't matter if a camera is HDR or SDR, that's, that's your typical scene. So you clearly don't need an HDR camera for everything. Um, but what about 20 stops? Well, it's really gosh darn hard to make a scene, find a scene with 20 stops at a dynamic range. And the reason why is because um, the very, very, uh, maybe in outer space, but, but in any, any real world application, if you have something that's really that bright in a scene, that's a million times brighter than the darkest part, it's very likely that really bright thing is gonna shed some photons on the dark part. And uh, when that happens, of course, it, it, it reduces the dynamic range. Um, a DSLR has uh, 12 to uh, 14 stops. I think we just saw above uh, uh, 10 stops for a, uh, a small sensor like a, a cell phone, GoPro, et cetera. HDR sensor, 20 stops. Um, human eye is about 10 to 14 stops uh, instantaneous and 24 in incident adaptation. For, and this is a, a graphic from Cambridge Color. You know, if you're if you're looking at something bright far away, your eye adapts to that. If you're looking at something close, your eye adapts to that. And, and your brain stitches all together as being a nice, you know, continuous tone image. So um, 20 stops is probably more than we need. Uh, that being said, how much does a, does a camera actually capture? So we know the sensor is going to be 20 stops uh, or 24 stops. But um, is that true of the entire camera system? And, and the answer is no. Um, I'm defining dynamic range of the whole camera in code space as being uh, uh, the clip pixel value minus one um, divided by the smallest code value with SNR greater than one. Now, we talked earlier about the different noise sources of having uh, uh, quantization noise, photon shot noise, dark current noise, read noise, et cetera. Um, there is another noise source which comes in, which is this veiling glare. Um, so here's, here's an image of 120 dB uh, uh, HDR target at, uh, at D3 Engineering, a company that I do a lot of work with. And uh, you, you can see there's just significant flare, which happens scatter, happens around the lens. Now this, this scatter can be subtracted off, but you remember you're, there's photon shot noise on top of that mean. So you can take off the, 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 the glare, um, there's still some photon shot noise left behind. Um, if we do some assumptions about the, uh, uh, the magnitude of the flare, um, the fact that uh, we do have some read noise, um, if we add it all up, um, the pixel value with an SNR greater than one, swagging it is around 16. Um, and so then if we take our 20 stops, um, divide out our, our 16 uh, stops of uh, in the denominator here, that gives us about two to the 16. So I'm saying that because of flare, because of read noise, because of uh, uh, gains in the system, um, we, we end up with um, about 16 stops at dynamic range in a camera, even though the sensor itself may be 20 stops at dynamic range. 
that um, means that uh, not only not only uh, noise like you know, the sensor itself but the optics also plays a part in reducing the dynamic range so maybe your sensor is theoretically say 120 db but you are getting uh, constrained say you are losing some or chopping some of that dynamic range because of the optics also exactly thanks a lot Well, so, so, and it, it may seem like a lot, but, but keep in mind that um, 120 dB is a million to one, right? Yeah. Um, imagine a scene where you have a light source that's a million times brighter than the darkest part of the scene, but that million times thing doesn't illuminate the darkest part at all. Um, it certainly can't be indoors, right? Because, uh, you know, it would reflect off services inside the room. And, and, and the through secondary reflections, whatever, would probably find itself pretty much everywhere. Um, in fact, in this room, all the lights were out. Um, and, and, and this is the tabletop that the, uh, that the target was on. This is actually a, an LED on the back of the uh, uh, unit, I think, uh, uh, shining off the back. And, and I mean, just, just look at the... Uh, uh, um, the the amount of, of, of flare that extends out from this um so th there there is a lot of uh, contamination if you will of uh of the dark by the bright just just in, inside the um uh, not only in the room but but I, i'm talking inside the camera itself so um yeah i mean look looking at some of the ghost reflections in there i mean you can see reflections off multiple lens surfaces yeah and, and i mean a lens, um, a lens is about the one to three percent uh, uh, internal reflections, right? Flare, mm -hmm. and, and so if you take if you take one percent of a million, um, uh, that's uh, that's a uh, uh, hundred thousand, right? So so you, yeah. you, uh, you you've got but now keep in mind it just depends on the size of the area and stuff. And I was trying to avoid getting into this whole analysis. In fact, I, I had a slide with all of that on there and I took it out and got <laughs> yeah. really busy. Yeah. But yes, um, the scatter that occurs inside the camera um, between the lenses uh, into the sensor um, uh, adds up and uh, raises the the, um, uh, uh, the dark level. Not, not the dark not the dark level in terms of black of the sensor, but, but the, um, the smallest value you can record. Uh, one more question. When you were referring to this scene uh, at the start of this uh, slide, so you referred it to as uh, 120 dB. So is this chart 120 dB chart or like how? Yes, uh, yes, yeah, that's, a, uh, that's an yeah. image engineering chart of 120 dB. Am I, am I correct, Keith? Okay. That is a 150 dB. Oh, 150. I, I misspoke. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Couldn't tell from the picture. <laughs> well, I, it looks like it's rendered, right? So that's an 8-bit representation. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> um, so, so let's talk about. Um, so I, I now just claim that that your your uh, uh, your sensor that has got 120 dB uh, or 20 stops of dynamic range as a camera can only collect 16. How much information is in there? So let, let's do a little mental experiment. Um, I ask you to give me, uh, I have you take two images, right? Of the exact same object, the exact same thing, the exact same setup, you capture it twice. And the only difference between the two images is the instance of noise in that image. Um, you give me those two images and then I, um, I, I do some processing and, and, and say that I can take one of those images and uh, um, reduce it down to uh, a, a smaller bit depth. Um, and then, I say I can I can recreate that original image, except for the different instance of noise. I give you back two images, and I say, tell me which one is the one that I reduced down to eight bits. And if you can't tell, I'm claiming that I have I, that there is no information lost. So in other words, if there's no analytical method, no statistical method, no method you can use to figure out that I crunched it down to eight bits and brought it back to its native bit depth, I'm claiming that that crunch to eight bits has uh, uh, no information loss, and uh, and here's 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 the uh, noise analysis of that. Um, here is a, a noise plot 
of uh, uh, a, a theoretical sensor with 20 uh, dB um, in a single capture. So you don't need to take two images and then uh, take the, uh, the short exposure one and multiply it up to uh, extend the dynamic range. It just natively has that kind of response. So here's, here's the noise of, of that image. Now here's, here's the noise of an image with an HDR sensor because of the bump um, is going to have, have more noise because uh, uh, we multiplied it by that number. Um, now, if I add quantization noise onto this, um, so see this, see this dotted line here? I, I've added quantization noise on top of the existing noise sources. So the quantization noise is based upon using a square root encoding. Um, and so square root encoding, of course, will uh, uh, have a greater quantization as you go up. And so the intervals will increase. And uh, uh, as those intervals increase, the quantization noise increases. But the quantization noise is so small compared to the photon shot noise, the incremental increase is very small. And this plot down here shows the percentage increase of um, uh, uh, noise by adding the quantization noise. And, and, and you know, the old uh, Sean Kelly phrase of standing on the shoulders of giants, um, uh, this, this isn't something that I realized on my own. And, and thank you to Mr. Pillman for bringing this to my attention years ago. But uh, applying that, that, that idea that I, that I gained, um, quantizing this a, a signal using a square root curve um, from 16 bits down to 8 bits, as you can see, the, the percentage increase in noise is very small. And I'm claiming that, that because it's very small, that I can take a 20, uh, 120 dB sensor with 16 uh, um, stops of dynamic range and get it down to an 8-bit encoding with a square root lookup table and uh, have virtually no information loss. I agree. Yay! You, you've shown me already, Wayne, so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> who invited the choir anyway? Um, <laughs> so so just, just to reflect on where we are, what we, how we got here. Um, I think I just said this, HDR sensors can detect 20 more stops in dynamic range, uh, seen as HDR because of its variation in luminance, not reflectance. Uh, HDR cameras are flare and noise limited to about 16 stops at dynamic range. And, and that information can be encoded nearly losslessly with uh, eight bits per channel. So out of all that blathering I did up to this point, uh, if you remember this part, we can, we can move on. You don't have to remember all the other details, but. Uh, the rest was support, but but I just wanted to to sum up to where we are because we're going to change gears slightly. Um, we talked about using that square root curve, but but is that really the best curve to use? And um, of course, it depends on what you're trying to do. Remember, the initial problem we're trying to solve was a customer came and said, "I have this HDR sensor. I want you to produce images that look exactly like my SDR sensor, only nothing clipped, and um, I want to use my pre-trained." Uh, uh, neural networks um, to uh, to use this imagery. Um, so uh, that that was that was the original goal. Can we get there with a square root curve? Um, I don't know. Let's let's look at the different different use cases. The two that I've isolated are, are human consumption, and uh, that that's where a human looks at an image on a monitor that's sourced with HDR data, and and uh, the goal there is to have an image that that you can see more more uh, seen content than you would a regular sensor. In a machine vision system, though, the goal is, is significantly different. In that case, the, the, uh, the, uh, the requirement is you really want to preserve as much information as possible because the whole point of the system is to, to extract semantic data, and, and that is all based upon the information content of what, what's in the image. So let's look at these two different renderings, how they differ, and what we might use for each. Um, so remember the claim of, uh, I want to have an HDR image rendered throughout the entire tone scale with no loss of color fidelity because it's HDR. Of course, that's impossible. Um, the RGB specification defines the display condition, not, not the capture condition. Um, and and the, uh, the spec says that uh, an a, uh, uh, a sRGB display device has 8.6 stops at dynamic range. If I were to take a Macbeth color checker, and if I were to do a, a rendering on it with um, a perfect color rendering, 
uh, colorimetric rendering that occupies um, 0 to 243 uh, of the uh, sRGB 8-bit space. If we just look at the neutral scale, it's 20, 49 to 243. So in other words, if my five stops occupies this much, how am I going to get 20 stops at dynamic range onto an sRGB image and, uh, um, and not have any loss of color fidelity? And of course, the answer is yeah, you clearly can't. Um, so what would be a, a, a good rendering? Um, if I can quote uh, uh, another name from the past, uh, Ted Gundell, he said to me, um, feel free to do anything in, to an image that you want. Um, but if you have no explanation for the physical basis of what you're doing and why you're doing it, then you're just making stuff up. Um, and so there's a lot of ways you can convert an HDR image to a um, uh, eight bit image, but but if you can't provide some physical basis of why you're doing it, then um, you know you're just making stuff up. Uh, the image below here is is a, a, a rendering method called adaptive scene lighting, and and the basic premise behind that is, as I said earlier, the um, uh, high dynamic range of an image is not because of the range of reflectances; it's due to the range of uh, uh, scene illumination. If you can take uh, an input image, estimate the distribution of light across the image, and then relight the scene as though the scene was more uniformly lit, um, you can create a very plausible image uh, like the one below, um, which fits nicely into an 8-bit container by, by taking out the, uh, uh, the distribution of lighting. Um, and this, this method, we, we, in, in Kodak, we call that KPT. Um, the rest of the world calls it adaptive scene lighting or, or local tone mapping. So there, there, there's one way for human consumption. Um, another, another method can be applied is a, um, a slope limited log function. Uh, log functions are nice because it, it, each, each stop at dynamic range is allocated the same number of, uh, of counts. Um, uh, here's an example of a log encoding. It has to be, of course, slope limited because the uh, at, at zero the slope is infinity, which is uh, a little rough on a system. I, I, I tell my kids, you know, anytime you divide by zero, something bad will happen. Um, so, so here's one, one alternative. But let's look at uh, a range of outputs. So, here is uh, a, an example. Thank you, uh, Keith, for uh, capturing this picture. Uh, here's an HDR image. And you can see uh, there are three three color checkers, and this one is rendered using the adaptive scene lighting I just talked about. Um, over here is is a log encoding, and uh, that has the advantage of uh, it's a fixed. This can be very computationally difficult, and it's hard to do um, in real time at video rates. Uh, there are some ISP chips that that do it. Um, we don't have a lot of experience with, with them with them yet. Um, a fixed LUT is very simple, and uh, the rendering here for human consumption is not too bad. And like I said, it has the advantage of uh, setting the same number of code values for each stop of the dynamic range. It's um, it's not exactly uh, uh, contrasting, and um, if your machine vision system was trained with SDR images, it certainly hasn't got a tone scale that matches the SDR images. Uh, here's a tone scale that matches the SDR images, but if you were using this image to train the um, uh, uh, machine vision system and your job was to count, for example, color checkers, you'd count one, maybe two, but you'd probably miss that one. Um, here's a square root function we talked about originally, and uh, if you were to count color checkers, you'd count uh, two, you'd probably miss this one. Um, but, but the information's in there because if we take this very same sRGB uh, uh, container, a rendered image, and uh, stretch it, um, the data does exist there. It's just not visible to a human observer. And, and that, that's the, uh, the point I want to make here is um, this sRGB rendering to a human, um, humans like to see things mid-scale. We, 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 we don't visualize this very well. We don't, we don't see it. Um, Obviously, the data, is, the data is in the file, but it's not, it's not visible. So if you use this image for, um, for labeling, uh, you, you would miss one of the color checkers. 
So the, the point being here is that a human rendering and a machine vision rendering are two very different things. Um, this, this image as an sRGB, as a, I hate to say sRGB because it's not the right color space, but in an 8-bit non-linear encoding, um, is just not impedance matched, if I can use that term, well to a human observer, um, even though for a machine vision system, it contains all the data necessary to see all, all three charts. Um, so what I want to talk about next is um, in the context of a machine vision workflow and, and how that works. And, and the way it works is, and we're going to look at the, red, the reds first, um, there's a labeling phase where uh, you have a, a set of images which are required um, and you want to use this as your training database. Some human has to sit down and look at these renderings. And so they're presumably, uh, they're sRGB renderings um, to identify the objects in the image. And that goes into a semantic database containing, uh, there's a person there, there's a person there, there's a ball there, et cetera. And so all the relevant data you want to extract from an image is put in a database and associated with that image. Um, then comes the training phase where the same database of images is fed into a network. Uh, the answers from the semantic database are here. So it knows the image, it knows the answer, it adjusts the weights to come up with a trained network that ultimately when you put in your image, you get the right answer. Well, what customers have been asking for is I want to take train it with my SDR database. Um, I want to put it in my SDR database for the training and um, uh, uh, then run HDR images and get an output. And, and that sadly is not a, not a good combination. Um, what I propose as being a good workflow is we render the images two different ways. Uh, because this is not at video rates, I don't think people can uh, label images at video rates. Um, you would take your, uh, your images, your HDR images, and do the human rendering, do the, uh, do the adaptive scene, uh, adaptive uh, tone scaling. Um, so then that way, all of, the, uh, um, all of the objects in the scene would be readily visible to the human doing the training. Um, during training, convert all of your old SDR assets to a, to a log, and then re-render the, uh, the HDR image that you captured to log as well, and then train your database, uh, train your uh, neural network um, on, on uh, HDR data, log space. And then when it comes to deployment, since all your images are a nice fixed log coming in, they've been trained on log, including the old assets, you would end up with a, a well-trained network that works well in log space, uh, that has uh, very little information loss and would deliver all the things that the customer has been asking for. So uh, that would be a model of a labeling, training, and, and deployment that could take the 20-bit HDR data, which only holds 16 bits of uh, uh, dynamic range, which we can code into eight bits of information. Um, and uh, uh, we can use that whole system to deploy a system which is properly trained and, uh, uh, and, and deployed against images uh, uh, that were in the same color space as they're deployed. So that's, that's, that's the whole concept. And one more gilding the lily, one more little tweak. Um, in humans, and I, maybe this is folklore, but uh, you know, I've heard it said that uh, once you get above an SNR of say like 60, right? Um, increasing the SNR isn't really visible because once the noise level drops to a certain point, um, in other words, an SNR of 60 looks like an SNR of 100, which looks the same as an SNR of 1,000, which looks the same as an SNR of 10,000. There's a point at which that uh, the noise doesn't really become apparent or improve the quality of the image. Um, kind of making a notional uh, uh, plot here, um, as you increase SNR, the same should be true for a uh, machine vision system. Um, as the SNR increases, the probability of detecting the semantic objects in there and the success of doing so is a function of SNR. And there must be some level at which adding more SNR doesn't improve. Um, when we did this noise analysis back, uh, uh, back here um, with the square root curve, um, we, we, we added some noise to it. But what if instead we said, you know what? I want to add zero noise. So instead, I'm going to take my slope-limited log function. I'm going to keep it linear with slope one. 
um, up to that threshold where SNR doesn't improve anymore and then push further quantization noise out into that area where uh, um, it's above a threshold above which uh, uh, um, having higher SNR doesn't help. And so in that case, um, we, can, uh, uh, we can apply that as an encoding. Um, and finally, uh, uh, use a high um, gamut colors primaries, uh, Adobe RGB or Pro RGB. Um, and, and this is the coding that I would recommend for a system using, uh, 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 um, for, for this HDR log would be uh, training the system and deploying the system using a slope limited HDR where the slope is set to one for the, uh, for the darker parts of the image where you wanna um, maintain as much SNR as possible. And we're at the end and I can't believe you guys made it, but thank you. Um, so here's what we talked about. HDR sensors can detect 20 or more stops at dynamic range. Um, we tied it way back when. Um, it's the uh, illumination which makes the scene HDR, not the range of reflectance. Uh, because of flare and noise, the HDR sensor is limited to 16 stops. We can encode that uh, nearly losslessly at eight bits. Um, you cannot take an HDR scene and uh, 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 render it to an sRGB encoding and maintain color fidelity, um, even if someone else has seen it done before. Uh, machine visions and human vision systems have different optimization functions uh, for human consumption. Um, we want to make it so that we, we bring things into mid-tone scale where they can be seen by humans, um, but we don't want to do that so much for machine vision systems. Machine vision systems, the prime objective is to maintain uh, image information. Um, and finally, HDR image deployed in a machine vision system should be such that the rendering is compatible with the training set and the labeling is rendered to maximize the human visualization of the features. So a bifurcation of the rendering, one for human labeling and another one for training and deployment. So um, hopefully in all of that, and I didn't go too quickly, I hope, uh, hopefully all of that, there was, there was some insights that maybe you hadn't thought of in the same way before. But uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that may exist. I'm curious about you, the choice of log versus square root, because here you mention, you know, in your preferred workflow, you mentioned log. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I'm curious, it, it's ha not having thought of, it's not clear to me what, what are all of the pros and cons that drive your decision one way or the other. Yeah. Um, so, so I, I guess this would require a more analytical answer than I have. So, so forgive me and, and your question maybe well, well, well posed, well asked because uh, I don't have a good answer and, and maybe square root is actually the best one as I showed from the SNR perspective. I, I like the log because um, it gives you the, First of all, um, these these color checkers, right? These color checkers in log space have the exact same values differing only by an added uh, an, a, 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 a a number, right? Right. If I take if I take this and add a constant, I get this one. If I take this and add a constant, I get this one, right? Um, that's right. that's Although a nice. Maybe for the light too. The the one that's down there might be verging into the linear part. Okay, right. But, so I am making yeah. the kind of swag that um, um, uh, we're going to throw a linear section on there to pretend the whole thing's long. Okay, um, fair yeah. enough. So so I mean that that that's a nice property. Does that help in training? I don't I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't. I don't have a really good, good, better answer than that, other than I guess from a visualization perspective, it, it makes it a little more human friendly. Um, I didn't do the uh, SNR slope analysis throughout the entire tone scale to see if that what impact that has on uh, on this curve, and I should I should probably have done that with a log curve as well to support that, and I didn't. Yeah, but but I, I agree with you. yeah I, I can see where the 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 square root sounds tidier from a noise analysis point of view, but the log version seems to make photographic sense. Um, but never having trained a neural network, 
I have no firsthand knowledge of what properties it wants, but thank you. Sure. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good, good question. Well, Wayne, you mentioned early on about when you at, you're going from standard, uh, you know, SDR to the high dynamic range, that more of the improvement is at the highlight end as opposed to the shadow end. Did I grasp that correctly? And if so, why? Oh, um, the, the reason why, first of all, yes, you did. And, and the reason why is... Um, To make, to make a pixel more sensitive, right, um, you need to improve its quantum efficiency, right? That, that's if, um, and quantum efficiencies are already on the order of, uh, 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 at the peak, you know, uh, 60 to 90 percent. Um, there's, there's, not, there's not much more you can, you can get with that. Uh, but on the other hand, it's easier to make a pixel less sensitive, right? And we can make it less sensitive by, by decreasing the exposure time, or we make it less sensitive by, by making it making it smaller so that there's less incident photons on, on, a, on a given area. Yeah, or paraphrased differently, if I'm willing to use a larger sensor with larger pixels and a larger lens and a larger camera, Great, I can improve my sensitivity, but that's not not the option that people are usually willing to do. They 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 buy the biggest sensor they're willing to buy, and then after that, it's we can make it less sensitive. Right, or to say a little differently, if if all you have is a sensor, what can you change to uh, to make it more sensitive? Right. Yes. And the answer is not much. That that's. Uh, um, they, they've been working on that for years, and uh, and of course, every one is better than the last one, even though it's not. Well, it, it has a saleable feature, <laughs> it has a saleable advantage, but not yet. Not, yeah. yeah. yeah That's that a good question. Um, what, one of the one of the problems, and I, I I'm detecting it in Bruce as well. Um, maybe because he taught me much of what what, what I know, but um. There's a certain cynicism that comes with uh, uh, marketing materials with sensors over the years. And if you read enough times why this sensor is better than the last one, after a while, you start to get a little a little skeptical. Mm -hmm. I have always been skeptical of the, like, you know, the figures that are given for dynamic range, to, to be honest. And uh, most of the marketing materials that I see they usually uh, try to make uh, like you know make the present version uh, look more advantageous in terms like you know we have uh, much better like nobody talks about quantum efficiency i think mostly it is say it says that you know 120 and i'm talking about say from past two years three years that this one is say 120 db and uh, somehow it looks a little bit fishy to me like how each but each particular version or uh, newer version that comes uh, keeps on increasing, like you know the performance, and without giving the baseline of say how they increased it. Yeah, and and I I'm I do believe that that the uh, the, the folks who said that are 120 dB, I I'm I'm sure there's a test condition under which they can obtain that. With a raw sensor without optics in front of it, um, and and I, I I I don't I don't doubt the marketing materials and the claims they make. I think where they lose me is in the practical application, which is what the point of this talk was. Um, I, Bruce, forgive me if I if I misquoted you on this, but I think you once called me militantly pragmatic. Um, and uh, the point being is that that much of what I do is try to take what what's been claimed and what's been said and turn it into what how do I actually use it and deploy it into a system so that it works and and that was the point of this this whole talk and hopefully um, it, it's to try to convert from the the claims of what what exists and what's out there to to what you can actually get um, well, we had a customer who actually said um, 
you need to prove to me that my camera really is 120 dB. And um, to do that required um, uh, such a contrived scene where only one pixel was just one count above the, um, uh, uh, the clipping level, so, and everything else was absolutely black. Um, and then a tone scale in an 8-bit space that was so oddly shaped that it preserved that one bright pixel, um, wasted the entire tone scale in the mid-range, and allowed some slope in the bottom was the only way to show that it was 120 dB. And in fact, even that, I believe, failed. Am I right, Keith? I'm having visions of that tone curve, actually. It was, it was not a curve. It was more like a step function. Yeah, so, so I mean, yes, I, 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 by the way, thank you for that comment. Um, I, yeah, you're, I, I think the marketing materials are, everyone has to be competitive and come up with their best story. But, but as engineers, I think our job is, thank you for your best story. Customer, here's what I can give you. And that, that was the point I was trying to make. Yeah, well, I guess the other thing that, that occurs to me, you know, listening to that story is, it sounds like that customer heard that they bought a 120 dB sensor and then said they want you to prove that their camera has 120 dB. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. I, I, sorry. That. <laughs> well. Yeah. Anyway. Well, and that's what we had to explain to them. And you know, after after months of making the argument and doing analyses, um, I think they came around. Right. But it took a lot of convincing. I sympathize. I can appreciate how long how painful that process was to teach them what they really didn't want to know. Well, Wayne taught me and we taught them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other questions for Wayne? Another sleep. Well, geeky one, diving into details, maybe we don't have time, for, but I'll ask anyway. Um, having worked so much with these sensors, when you're, when I, what I imagine what's going to go on with my color errors, combining extended dynamic range with nonlinearities and color reproduction, how significant are the nonlinearities for these sensors by the time you do the, ex do, do the extended dynamic or HDR work? Yeah, um, the good news is, um, I'm trying to find the right slide here. Because we're using both, both we're using the sensor different ways and, and both of them are in the linear region. So right. we, don't see, we don't see a lot of uh, non-linear. We're not trying to push it. I, I know what you're saying is the CMS has a, have its roll off on the top end. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, but we're not trying to go near there. We're using it. We're using it like a normal sensor in a good old linear portion, or just shifting that linear portion by reducing the quantum efficiency or the uh, the integration time. Either way, we're just reducing the number of photons we're collecting. Right. Thank you. Yeah, that make that makes beautiful sense. Thanks. Yeah, that's that is uh, that is helpful. That's uh, kind of where I was going. This um, this is Peter. Uh, I my. General question was based on this analysis, what has been uh, the reception of those who are asking for this sort of design and um, their experience with their unexpected pros and cons after following this kind of uh, encoding? Okay, so Peter, here's where you make me cry. I have not convinced a single customer that this is the approach to use. They don't believe me. I've oh. had customers say, Thank you for your analysis. I agree with all of your math, but I don't agree with your conclusion. Uh, all we can do is advise. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, part of the motivation for creating this, this, this deck, by the way, is, is the more people who have been exposed to this and can speak to this, um, hopefully the less I'll run to, or, 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 or um, um, do you know, sorry for this little tension here, but do you know, you know the song Alice's Restaurant? Not well. But I, uh, yes, I know yeah, them. yeah, I'm familiar. I remember yeah. you said so, you forced me to listen to it once. Wayne. Okay, so so um, <laughs> it goes on. The song goes on for 20 minutes, and in the end, he says, "Well, the reason why I wrote this, this story is because, well, you may be in a similar situation, or you may know somebody in a similar situation, and if that should occur, <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. Fair after enough. going on for uh, an hour and a half here, almost, 
um, I, 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 I submit this to you for you may be in a similar situation or you may know somebody in a similar situation. And now you have the tools to say, oh, but this is my understanding. I'm curious how on earth, I mean, if, if you'd go to your preferred training slide, um, and I suppose I should let people escape, but you can, somebody can cut me off. Um, which workflow are they actually using and how do they expect it to work? Okay, so they're training, they're labeling on SDR. They're training on SDR. They have their trained SDR system. They want to throw an HDR system at it that has all the properties of an HDR system uh, image um, that works automatically. It's just You just run it and it goes. They want their HDR pictures to look exactly like their SDR pictures, only be HDR. I, I, I'd be amused to, to hear how their results work because I'm picturing, I, I mean, I don't know. I, it, it's, I, I don't know why anybody would expect that to work. Um, here's why it works. It works because most scenes aren't HDR. Yes, it works in the 80% easy time, easy part of the time when it's not really HDR and it doesn't make much difference. Right, and it's not needed. So, right. Yep. Wayne, you can, you can take some part in knowing that one of our uh, big customers did actually retrain their neural net on HDR captures. That was when I went down to Florida for that. For oh, that very good. Yeah. But, but, but so, they but, didn't... so we managed to convince them. <laughs> right. Did we use a square root encoding on those? No. Oh. No, we didn't. Oh. We should have. Well, I mean, how much of that is, is I, I guess it's not, it, it's all pre-ISP, right? All that stuff. Or is it? No, is this it is all post, yeah, this is all post-ISP. Okay. But the ISP doesn't have to have any notion of, of log encoding or square root encoding or anything like that, right? Well, no, it goes, I, you, instead of using a gamma curve, you, you, you swap in these different. Uh, swap in the different. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is for your PWL. You change the shape of the PWL, which, by the way, I admit I'm irritated that it's that it's called PWL instead of something more descriptive. But oh, um, so um, so actually, that remains the same because that becomes undone as it goes back to a linear space in the ISP. Oh, and, okay. And and full double secret disclosure, which I can't say under NDA, but um. Uh, when you undo a 20-bit PWL, um, the result is something not greater than 20 bits. Um, sometimes it's equal to 20 bits, and sometimes it's the other option. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, carrying 20 bits through an ISP is, is uh, um, not universally supported. I'll put it that way. <laughs> yeah. There's also the shape of the PWL curve that can that can cause loss for when you go from 20 to 12 and then 12 yeah. back to 20. And I, I didn't include that in this analysis, but but I mean the bottom line is there's a lot of numbers that you can throw into this this noise thing here, which I didn't do. Um, but but the point is the point is uh, uh, using a, a generous analysis. If if I added 0.25 percent noise increase into my image. Um, uh, you know, that's, that's not a lot. Um, right. I, I, guess, I guess you could claim that if the existing noise, before I do the 8-bit um, uh, encoding, if the existing noise is higher, this percentage goes down, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, the, 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 the and of course, the whole reason the whole thing is because photon noise, photon noise got in there, not, not because of anyone's incompetence, not because people don't have design circuits, not because um, uh, uh, people aren't careful with signal processing. Um, uh, uh, that, was, that was what you were given. It is basically the limitation, physical limitation. Yeah. So. Yeah, we haven't figured out a way to make the photons yep. arrive in a perfectly uniform way. 
I'm, I don't know enough science to imagine how we would ever do that. That'd be a cool trick. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so you, you this slide being, uh, like, you know, I remember one particular instance where uh, we were discussing noise uh, uh, with a customer and we were uh, asked why, like, you know, like, uh, photon shock noise was one of the uh, culprits uh, that my uh, one of the superiors told, but we got asked, uh, what about the other noise sources? For example, like, you know, uh, read noise or quantization noise. And uh, he replied that it, it is all other sources are negligible. So I get it from this slide, how and why. So thanks for that. Right, um, except for the very low end. So you see this slight separation down here? And this yeah. was measured off of, off of a, a real camera. This isn't a simulation or anything, but I mean, there, there's, it's a proportion thing, right? So, um, you know, if you add up these noise sources and say they add up to uh, to three, right? Um, three three as a ratio of, of, of one or two is big, but when you get up to 64, it's, it's, it's nothing. It's um, nothing, yeah. And, and that that that's why you see a slight a slight split down here, but you don't see it at the top end. Fine. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you, Wayne. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for your attention. Um, you've been a great audience. Well, thanks, Wayne. <laughs> uh, no, the, the the questions have been wonderful, and the discussions wonderful, and uh, um, thank thank you all for your attention. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, and yeah. I appreciate all the information that you gave. It was highly useful. Thanks a lot. Very well. Bruce, Bruce it was great hearing your voice again. Thanks. It was great hearing you too, Keith. <laughs> all right. Well, thank, thanks, everyone. Hey, bye-bye. Have a great day. Bye. 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 Bye.